Aloha no, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Mahalo for joining me for another Long Story Short, another island program produced and broadcast by locally owned nonprofit PBS Hawaii. When singer Robert Casimero stopped by to talk with me one on one, he wasn't alone. He mentioned that his ancestors, all those who went before, were right behind him. And part of the reason he's driven to meet high standards is the heavy obligation he feels to make them proud. Coming up next, part two of a two-part conversation with musical artist Robert Casimero. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, produced with Sony Technology, is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in HD. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Robert Casimero is more than a successful singer and recording artist. He's also a most respected kumu hula, teacher of Hawaiian dance. His all-male hula school is called Halau na Kamale. The Halau is the subject of a documentary being shown on PBS stations nationwide that explores expectations and stereotypes following the Halau as it prepares for competition. Produced and directed by Lisette Mary Flannery, Nakamale, Men of Hula, shows us Robert Casimero's exacting and sometimes harsh teaching style, and it reflects his deep devotion to his kumu, the late Mikey Ayu Lake. I had a hard time with that because they wanted me to tell stories about my kumu. And you know, outside of the family, we don't tell stories because it's just so personal, you know. I didn't want to tell stories. And then I, so I said to Lisette, if this will help to show my respect for my teacher, then I'll do it. Not realizing that it was really going to show a lot more and that it was okay. And that what, what I found out about my students is that they love me like how I love my teacher. Sorry. How easy was it for you to control people's lives. I mean, that's, I mean, Kumu that's Hula, a really by definition, is a control freak, right? Yeah, it, it, yeah. I, I'm yeah. not saying it very no, no, graciously. No, 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 it's true, but, though, yeah. And you have, there is such a power in being a Kumu Hula, you know, that, that is willingly given to you when the students come in, uh, because it's what I did with mine, you know. If she told me to jump off a building, I would have asked which one, and how much higher do you want me to go? Because I just, you just love them, you know. But I didn't really know how to become a kumu. It's like being a parent. You really don't know how to be a mother or father until you have kids and they teach you how to be that way. It was the same thing with being a teacher. When, when I started, my kids were like 15, 16 years old and I was like 23, 24. And the only way I knew how to do it was to scare the, well, to scare the. And you use uh, those words too, right? Yeah. You would swear? Yep. You'd call them names? Yep. I did. And they would say to me, you know, I don't even let my parents talk to me this way. I was like, I'm not your parent. I'm your kumu. So you just better get over it or there's the door. You know, and luckily they stayed. Or luckily they didn't beat me up. You know. And by definition, you're also, you have to keep order and discipline. Um, how did you decide how hardcore you were going to be as a disciplinarian, as somebody who punishes or, or has control over second chances, that, third chances? Yeah, I play that by ear. Um, I set really, you know, some really heavy duty rules on them. And if they broke it, then, you know, there was no, there was no second chance. Well, what's an example of a heavy duty rule? Well, you know, I did not like drugs. I was never a drug person. I, I well, sans liquor, uh, sometimes. But uh, yeah, so it's like, you know, if, if I knew that you were coming to a performance and if you were stoned, then you're out from the performance and the halal too. You had to be a certain look, you know. No one could, I still say it, although I'm much more lenient now, that the student, no student could dance if they were bigger than me. And back then, I was almost 300 pounds when I first started, you know. So they all had to make sure that in the clothes, they look good. Otherwise, because, you know, people, people don't really want to see guys dance in clothes. You got to wear those malo things and, and the lava lavas. And I never could wear them because... Well, because you know, but they had to, you know, because it was the look and, and I wanted to make sure that people knew who we were. At that time, you had the only male halal. Yeah. Is it still the only male halal? You know, halal? I, I think it is because most people have both women and men dancing for them. But it was really Mikey's dream that I teach only men. And I, 
I'll tell you, like I said, I would have done anything, anything she asked. So I had no problem saying, okay, I'll do it. The thing that you need to know about if you're going to teach, Leslie, you're ever going to teach men you want yes. to be a kumuhula? You'd be not making any money. As men, opposed to teaching women, you would make money? Women, you can make money. People buy houses by teaching women. Teaching men, you will not make money. Because? They're not going to pay you to teach them how to dance hula. They're, and there go, it goes back to my kumu again, who said, if a man dances for you, then it is a privilege that you should have them. So I, you know, when I was in Halal, I, uh, I was constantly on scholarship. And so that's the way I've run my Halal ever since, that it's all scholarship. Oh, you, you teach for free. Yeah. Yeah, and then when we need money, then we have a fundraiser. Or if it needs supplementation, I have my career. And I swear my kumu knew that too, because I'm like her. She needs six of these things done. Her daughter says, you can't have the money. She'll grab her money and do it herself. And I do the same thing. You know, it's like, well, no one tells me no when it comes to the halal. But if I want something and they're like, you know, we don't have that much money, we're getting it. Yeah, we're going to just do it. As successful as the halal has been, I've heard you say in the past that it's not easy to get men to dance. Yes, yeah, it gets harder and harder as the years go along. Although a new revelation has come along for us, and that is that now the sons of my students are dancing for me. And, you know, I've graduated students as teachers. The four of them are teaching uh, even as we speak. And that's a legacy, that really is. But as far as, a, for me, a, a, a real legacy and a continuation so that I can actually see it myself, having the kids of my dancers with me, it, is, it, makes, you, it makes me want to live longer. It really does. And, uh, and it makes me want to be a better teacher, too. How does someone get into your halal? Can any guy get into your halal? Well, no. <laughs> no, you can't. You have to be invited. And all of your dancers are part Hawaiian? No. They're no, not? No. And I don't think that's really important either. And that comes from my kumu, you know, because it's, it's more about the heart, I think. And the fact that once you become a part, a member of my halau, then you are Hawaiian to me because now you're not just a member of the halau, but a member of the family. The family. Yeah. yeah. And so, all my family, all my brothers and sisters and my nieces and nephews, they all know these guys and they all know my family. So several years ago we had a, a family reunion in Kohala and they said, you know, we're, we're all going. And I was like, no, you're not. They're like, oh yeah, we are. Because Sister Jean and Sister Jerry told us and Cousin Momi that we're family. So they all came. We all went to Kohala together. And What's more important, blast. heart or, act or, uh, heart or uh, dancing ability? Oh, uh, right now, today, at this very moment with you and me, heart. But tomorrow, dancing ability. Tomorrow, if we have a show to do and it's time to get on the stage, dancing ability. But for right now, heart. But it doesn't mean I'll get rid of you. You know, where before, I would get rid of people much faster. Today, I'm much more lenient. Among your students in your halal, you've admitted your brother. Yes. Roland came to halal for, for a while. I think it was a little over a year. And I kicked him out of halal because he was given an assignment and uh, he didn't finish it. What was the assignment? He had to learn two chants. And, uh, and we laugh about it today because had he learned, especially one of them, we'd be, we do it all the time in our lives, you know, all the time now. Um, but I, I, I give my brother a lot of credit. You know, we're born as brothers in this lifetime. And then he goes and puts himself again uh, in my life by being a student. That's, that's a difficult thing Well, you to could do. give him a second chance. Well, the second chance is that he's no longer a student, but he is a kokua. So my brother is there all the time. And I think in being the kokua now, it's better than being a student. Because uh, you still get the lessons, but you don't get too much of the same pressure that happened. And what's happened is I've learned from that lesson too, and I've because of him, I've learned to be able to give chances to others where before I would have got rid of them like how I, I did him, you know. And the other thing is you can't talk back to me. You can't <laughs> talk back to me. You would never stop talking back you to me. You can't talk back, I know. And Roland would like, you know, you can't talk back to me. Not in front of my students. You can't talk back to me. That's just the way it is. But he can as a kokua? Yeah. 
Yeah. So he worked it out. Yeah, he did. And I'm really glad he's a Kokua. And um, yeah, I love him. He's a good guy. I've never said that before on camera either. That took a bit. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to want copies. <laughs> I think so too. He'll be sending out to the family. In birth order, Robert and Roland are number 10 and number 11 in a family of 12 children from Kalihi. The two men are family for life and highly successful musical partners for more than 30 years now. Appreciating family and health became more important than ever to Robert in 1990. That's when he found out he has diabetes. You were 300 pounds at one point? Oh yeah, yeah. It was a long time ago, but still it was a part of my life. I, I look at those pictures and I go, who is this monstrous person? Had you always been heavy as a kid? Yeah, yeah, I always was. And then in 1990, my doctor said to me, he says, you know, you gotta watch out because you're a diabetic now. And I was like, oh, okay. So he said, you have to really think about this and you know, you have to cut down and you have to do this and you have to exercise and stuff. And I was like, oh, jeez, what a bummer. And I started walking in 1990 and um, it's been my companion for that long now. And it's, it's kept me down so that I'm now, I fluctuate between 197 to 204 pounds. And it helps with everything, you know, the heart, the blood, um, the breathing, stuff like that. That's right, breathing. I mean, you, you have to have good breath control or, or you lose your occupation. And that's why, you know, I, 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 I never liked cigarettes. Uh, my father was real adamant about us smoking, you know. So I, I never liked that because I thought, Okay, I'm gonna tell you another story. Shoot. When uh, when Peter Roland and I were recording our second album called uh, Guava Jam, no, sorry, Guava Jam was first, Crack Seed was second. I had just finished singing a song called The Queen's Jubilee from a uh, family songbook of the EO Cares. And I was sitting in the studio and Peter and Roland and the engineer were in that small room that they're over there and he said, Peter said, okay, we're gonna play this back to you. I was like, all right. So there were two big speakers here and they started playing the song and I'm singing along with it. Well, there was a mirror on the floor on the side of here and I just happened to glance over it and I was looking at myself in the mirror and I thought, I, I found it very difficult to believe that the person I was looking at in the mirror uh, was the, the owner of this voice that was coming through because I didn't feel that that person matched the beauty of the voice. Mm. And that for me was, um, uh, what's that word? Epiphany. Mm -hmm. It was an epiphany for me and I, I kind of realized that this voice was something special and that's when I decided that I better take care of it. So all these years, you know, losing the weight and keeping it down and exercising and watching what you eat. And continuing to take voice lessons. And continuing to take voice lessons with my dear Kumuleo Neva Rego, who I love to pieces. Both Roland and I went to Neva at a time where our voices were beginning to fade a bit. We, we weren't aware of it. Well, maybe we were, and that's why we went, you know. But she added so much to, uh, to what we needed to remember and do, and still does, you know. I, I don't go as often as I used to, but she has spies. And they'll come and they'll see us and they'll call her and then she'll call me and she'll go, Roberto, think <laughs> Can you come see Auntie Neva? And it's all about getting the best of your voice at any time in your yeah. life. And to keep it going, you know. My, my doctor, Kalani Brady, uh, who is a, also a student of Neva's, you know, we're all kind of like intertwined. So there's Neva and me and there's Kalani and there's Roland and all of us and stuff like this. And they always say to me, you know, this is something special. You have to take care of it. We're gonna help you the best we can. So it's an obligation too. You, know. you mentioned the, the beauty of your voice, which is so true. Um, how do you look at that? Do you see that as a, as a gift you, you, you take care of, or do you think it of something you created? Or No, I think it was a gift. I really do. Um, and I find that as I get older now, and, and as, as much as I love to sing, I think, it's, I think singing makes me beautiful. I also think that it's one of the most honest and scariest things that I do in my life. Because when I'm on stage, 
or I'm at home, or at a cousin's party, and if I'm singing, it is the most honest I could possibly be. I am as wide open as a book, and you can read all the chapters, because nothing, <laughs> nothing's been blocked or censored. It's just honestly, blatantly there. Well, funny you should say that, because I was reviewing what's been written about you over the years, but, you know, I didn't really see a lot about who you are. Just yeah. what you do. Is that because you keep it close? You know, I, it's not that I, I, I do that conscientiously. It's just I've always felt when we were talking to anybody being interviewed, you know, that has a game plan. We're talking about this CD. We're talking about this May Day concert. We're talking about entering Mary Monarch and why we're doing it. And, um, and so I did that, you know. Someday someone will. And... Maybe it'll happen. I'm not real sure. I mean, well, you could do it now. Okay, cool. <laughs> I would just like to know what what drives you, what moves you, what. I think first of all, um, my my family, and uh, and my kupuna, the the ancestors, and the fact that I feel that the, my heaviest obligation is to make them proud to not make them embarrassed because, and I've said this before and I love this image, that even as I'm here speaking to you, there are thousands of people behind me right now. Some I know and some I don't. From generations from back? From generations before, from countries that I don't even know about, they're just here. And you don't want them rolling your eyes, yeah. their eyes. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. or this thing. You know how local people do that thing. I, and it would just kill me, um, but they're they're all here, and I, I feel an obligation towards them, and and you, and our people, and this land, and then I think if I'm going to do that, then I have to have an obligation to my health. Even as last night, I'm at a restaurant eating stuff that maybe I shouldn't have. You know, I didn't have the dessert, but okay, I had the pasta. Um, and then uh, when it comes to the hula. I have an obligation to my, my teacher and to my students, and I, I just want to be good for them. I want to really be good for them. And if it means that my personal life, my personal life does not suffer from anything. It suffers from me if I want it to suffer, okay? But my personal life is really the family. And it's a real broad use of the word family because it encompasses the ones that I'm related to by blood and those that I'm related to by heart. So, um, and it just keeps getting bigger. Sometimes I feel like I have no control over this, and at the same time, maybe I'm not supposed to. So, I live my life now in a, a I love to say this, a perpetual state of gratitude. I, I, am, I wake up every morning and I just, I say thank you to everybody and everything. You know, we're from Kohala on the Big Island. North Kohala? North Kohala. My mom is from uh, Havi and my dad's from Nyuli. And my mother used to say, when you go to Hawaii Island, she says, you must say hello to everyone. The people, the rocks, the ocean, the trees, because they're related to all of us, you know. Uh, it's how I feel with, uh, with everybody that we meet now, you know. That there is a purpose and nothing is by accident. And that I'm there to learn the lessons that are happening and that I'm really, really grateful. It's been such a long haul for Hawaiians who still uh, populate our prisons and are, are represented on the poverty lists, mm -hmm. and many haven't had access to Hawaiian homelands. I mean, how do you see the Hawaiian condition today? Oh, I think it's appalling. At the same time, though, I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones, you know, who Hawaiians will look at me and say, uh, well, sometimes they'll say, you know, you sold out. I don't, I'm not so sure how I did that. I was just working. But the other thing they say is, you know, I want to be like you. And I'm thinking, oh, I don't know whether you want to do that either. You know, but if I can help in any way I can. And I think of Don Hall. Because he said to me one night when we were at, uh, you know, he used to go to Macaulay Chop Suey all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I was 3 a.m. Yeah, yeah, there you are. Okay. <laughs> Order all that food. And Don said to me, he says, you know, I, I, when people ask for money, I give them money, our people. He said, are you going to do the same thing? I said, I don't know that I can give them money, but I'm going to give them what I can, you know, and if it's the voice or if it's just being there, then, then I'll do it. Do what you can with yeah. what you have. Yeah, yeah. God, I, 
I can't believe I said some of that stuff. <laughs> and I, for, I forgot, Don, who used to go to Macaulay Chop Suey in yeah. the middle of the night. No, but it's true. you you got to decide you know, how far you're willing to go and how much you're willing to yeah. give. And you cannot just talk it. If you said something already, you know, people remember. They can go back now, especially with the Internet. You can go back and see what I said 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's interesting. He was trying to get you to um, do the same thing he was doing. Yeah, yeah. And you know, Don was one of our greatest supporters. Wow. So not com he, didn't, he didn't feel a competitive no, deal. No, he just he he liked what we did, and his mother liked us. So you know it's a Hawaiian thing. You know, yeah. you're a local yeah. girl. You understand that. <laughs> you know, I used to always say, I I don't know that I would go to war for the United States of America. I don't know that I would kill someone for the United States of America, but if they're threatening Hawaii, I would. I would, I, would be, I would stand out front. And years ago, we had this, uh, there was a uh, kue. Was, there was a march of all Hawaiians. It started at the uh, Aloha Tower and came up to the palace. Several, Ala, myself, Mapuana, maybe Vicky, we were there at the front. And our job, Manu, we were to chant all these people as we came in continuously. It was to be hours and hours of our chanting these people in. And just before they were going to open the gates, someone had told us that there might be something happening that would include, you know, guns and, and stuff like this. And Roland had told Allah, if anything happens, you grab my brother and you folks go in here. And you can talk the talk, but if you can't walk the walk, then what's the purpose of it? I said, you know, if anything's going to happen, then it's meant to happen. And I'm putting it out there right now. So if anything happens, I ain't going. I'm staying right here. I think it's how you, it, when you believe in something, whether it's our world or, or, or peace or, or just another person, uh, we have to do what is best for ourselves and hope that it's best for everyone too. You know, you mentioned that um, lyrics really speak to you in song. Um, what are the most beautiful lyrics that you sing and in what language are they? Well, there's, if I had to pick an English song, it would be two. Uh, one would be, David Gates wrote, uh, from Bread, he wrote a song called If. And my favorite line in that song is, and when my life and when my love, when my, and when my love for life is running dry, you come and pour yourself on me. When I sing that line, I just, it's like to me, the heavens open up and I am just drenched with all this love from the people who, who know me. The other one is um, from Carousel, I think. If I loved you, longing to tell you but afraid and shy. I let my golden chances pass me by. And I've let many a golden chance pass me by, but um, there's no regret. You can't have regrets. I refuse to have regrets. What about in Hawaiian? In Hawaiian, too many, too many. You know, for me, the most simplest things say the, say the most, the deep, have deepest meanings. Um, so, Oh gee, God, what's the, there are so many, I, I can't even think of, um, okay, there's a song that was written by Leigh Collins and it's called, they call it Ke Aloha, and it goes, Maku upoli mai oi, in the third verse it says, Wala uh, ino ho ia u i kahanu akaipo, that I am, uh, I become very relaxed and I am comfortable when I, can, when I can, when the scent of my lover is present. Um, I love that line because no one knows that scent except you, mm -hmm. you know. And whether they're there with you or not physically, that scent that you remember can put them right in front of you. And I think that's powerful. That's, you know. And an another one is from Pua Ahihi, written by Kavena, and it says, uh, uh, There's this one verse, though, and it talks about there's a flower. Okay, so it's, you know Lanihuli? 
Lanihuli is that mountain there at the Pali. When you're standing at the Pali lookout, it's the one on the left-hand side. And what it says is that you're, this person that you love is like a lehua flower up there, but is pretty much unreachable. And the reason that person is unreachable is because you put that person there. That that's how much your love uh, is extended to the fact that you would take this person that you love and put them so high out of reach that it's worth the love. That's what, that's what it means to me. Beautiful lyrics, lovely sentiments. Speaking of sentiments, I'd like to thank our viewers who've sent kind thoughts and encouraging words as PBS Hawaii works to deliver quality local programming that inspires, informs, and entertains. Mahalo to you and to Robert Casimero for sharing your time and joining me for this Long Story Short. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. You know, we've lost some just treasures of Hawaiian music, and just recently too. And of course you know that you've earned the place in that vaulted um, place, you know, that, that place, I mean, you're already there where, where you're a treasure. Um, do you ever think about how people will receive news sometime long from now, I hope, when, when you pass away? I, I think that's why I work so hard when we do an album, to make sure that it's the best that it can be. Because really, it's that music that's immortal. It's not this, it's that music. So I try hard and I, and I wonder, yeah, I wonder how they'll perceive it. You know, I wonder.